Good evening and once again welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, October the 31st, 2021. This is the second lesson of the day, the lesson that will be presented when we assemble at 6 p.m. here in Bellflower. And again, I, rem I invite everyone who is here, if you are in our area, to come and be with us as we gather to worship God. We do, we do meet each Sunday at 10.50 in the morning as well as 6 p.m. Uh, with two different lessons being presented on Sundays. And of course, we have Bible studies that we are engaged in right now online. Uh, but hopefully in the future, we will resume those in the building as well. But in the meantime, as always, again, you're welcome to come be with us. We, we would love to have you with us as we worship God uh, at the specified times. And as always, if you have questions about something I say in this lesson, uh, or in any lesson, uh, you know, feel free to leave comments below and, and I'll do my best to get back with you. But let's get on to the lesson at hand uh, uh, this evening. We've been engaged in a study dealing with the subject of premillennialism, uh, but I've decided to take a, a break for a couple of weeks um, due to the uh, intense nature of that particular study. So just kind of break it up a little bit. And so what I want to do tonight is what I've uh, for a number of years engaged in in the fifth Sunday is I want to look at a song that we sing from time to time. And this particular song that we're going to deal with this evening uh, is in the hour of trial. And we have recently switched over to hymns for worship as our hymnal that we are using, and so that would be number 83 in that particular hymnal. If you have sacred selections, it's number 536. And that's the song that we want to examine for a few moments this evening. Now, this is a song that was actually written back in the 1800s, written in 1834 by a man named James Montgomery. But it actually wasn't published for until about 1853, so almost 20 years later. And what's interesting is if you actually do some research, and and, and there's a lot of great uh, research on, on the hymns that we sing today, you'll find that the version we sing today is it's a little bit different from the original. The, the wording is is actually a little easier for us to understand. And there, there's a couple of phrases in there that have been clarified that I believe, believe that are better. And also the tune that we use today actually was not adapted till about 1875. The tune prior to that was a little bit different than the one that we have today. And that's just some that's just some interesting background that's associated with this particular song. Of course, that's not our focus in these lessons. Our focus is to, to see how we can teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The very thing that we are instructed to do in God's Word in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 16 Ephesians 5 and in verse number 19 and in other places. We have always emphasized that if we are to be able to sing a song in worship to God, it needs to be true to God's word, which is why lessons like this, I believe, to be helpful as they help us to understand and remind us that what we are doing when we sing is we are teaching and admonishing one another, applying uh, the words of those songs to try and encourage and to praise God. So we're going to look at this particular song as it reminds us to put our trust in God, especially in troubling times, in the hour of trial. So let's go ahead and get started, and we're going to read the verses uh, one by one, and we're going to make observations, application to each verse. Uh, in verse number one, we read, In the hour of trial, Jesus plead for me, Lest by base denial I depart from thee. When thou seest me waver, with a look recall, nor for fear or favor suffer me to fall. So we have here in verse number one uh, a calling for our Lord to plead for us as we deal with difficulties in our lives. You know, when you think about the word trial, as it is used here, it's a reference to a testing, being tested. And when we think of trials, we don't just typically think of the small uh, challenges that we face, even though they are trials, 
uh, they, they are light trials, but, but what we think about are the difficult and unpleasant tests that actually try our character, and they try our faith. They challenge us, and they can be very, very difficult. They can reach down to the core of who we are. That's what we're dealing with when we think about a trial. So something that's going to that if we give into it, it's going to defeat us, and if we overcome, it's going to strengthen us as children of God. And when we think of the hour of trial, what typically comes to mind is is the idea of a time when testing is at its great at its greatest. And you know, I'm reminded of Revelation chapter three, Revelation chapter three, and in verse number twenty, where we find that the faithful church at, at, at Smyrna is being encouraged. And the, the Lord says, because you have kept my command and persev- to, to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And of course, the point is, is in some way, the Lord was going to protect those brethren. And I have to emphasize in that particular congregation, uh, he's, he's emphasizing to them that the Lord is going to keep them from having to endure any more than what they have had to endure thus far. And thus that was a source of hope to them from that standpoint. Now we go on and another thing to consider about this is in this expression, in the hour of trial, and, and I believe in verse number one, this is probably something that the author actually had in mind. In Luke chapter 22, We read Luke's account of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper, and after he institutes the Lord's Supper, beginning in verse 31 of Luke 22, we read this. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he, that is Peter, said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that or before you deny three times that you know me. So here we find the Lord telling Peter, warning Peter, Satan is asked to sift you. And he, he's going to pick you apart. He, he's going to He's going to put a trial on you that's going to be difficult for you to overcome. And Jesus then said, but I have prayed for you. And when you have overcome, I want you to strengthen your brethren. Of course, Peter denies it. He's he's, he's confident. I'll, I'll never deny you. And of course, Jesus then says to Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And if you go to Mark's account, before the rooster crows twice. So here we have, Uh, Here we have the warning that has taken place. Of course, we find that Jesus is arrested, and and while he's being dealt with by the the Jewish illegal phase of the trial as they're searching for witnesses and so on, we find that Peter goes to warm himself uh, in the fire of the enemy, and he's close by. For some reason, at least at some point, he has view of Jesus as, as they are dealing with Jesus. And we find that he follows at a distance in verse 54, chapter 22. And we find that he finds uh, there's a fire in the midst of the courtyard and he sits down there. And and a servant girl comes to him and and says, this man was also with him. And uh, Peter said in verse 57, I don't know him. And then we find uh, after a little while, another one saw him. You were with him. And Peter says, I was not. And about an hour later, it says, another confidently confirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he's a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I do not know you, what you are saying. And we find that immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and in verse 61 we read here, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. What a sad occasion we have here where where Peter, he's warming himself in the fire of the enemy, and and he ends up denying the Lord three times. And as the rooster crows, we read there in that verse 61 that Jesus looked at him and implied in that 
is that Peter saw the Lord as he looked at him, and then he remembered what the Lord had said, and so he went out and he wept bitterly. You might say that Peter was devastated as a result of that, and we can see a little bit of a change in Peter following this as he reacts and interacts with the Lord on this particular occasion. But of course, we also know that Peter was restored, and, and Peter would become very influential in, in, in the beginning of the church, uh, along with the other apostles. A lot of things would happen. As a matter of fact, it is believed, and, and, I, and I hold to this, that John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, this is after the resurrection of Jesus, that, that uh, Jesus interacts with a few of the apostles, and this is where Jesus, I, I, I believe he's restoring Peter on this particular occasion where he asks him three times, do you love me? And Peter's hesitant to use that word agape uh, because he knows what it involves and he knows what he's done. But Jesus continues to build him up and says, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to be there for my family. And you're going to do that. So we find Peter is restored. And of course, we know that to be the case. But anyways, I want you to keep this in mind as we look at this particular hymn that we are dealing with right now. So we find in the expression, in the hour of trial, we understand that we all face trials in this life. It's a part of life. Everybody faces problems. But often Christians face even more problems. And sometimes just by being a Christian in an ungodly world, we bring on additional tests and trials to our lives. Paul told Timothy, all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. And of course, we need to understand that Satan is our enemy. And he is going to do everything that he can possibly do to devour us. He walks about like a roaring lion looking for opportunities. He wants to take advantage of us, which is why Paul warned us, not to be ignorant of his devices in 2 Peter 2 and in verse 11. Now, the question is, when we face hours of trial, what will we do about it? Well, let's consider some things in this psalm. In the hour of trial, Jesus plead for me. Now, remember in Peter's account here that Jesus said, pray for me. And as I understand in the original of this song, that's the way that it began. In the hour of trial, Jesus, pray for me. And if you're keeping it in the context of the event that took place, then certainly that is something that would apply. But I believe that the way that we sing it now is actually more, uh, is, a, is more accurate for us. It's a better way to apply it. Not that Jesus cannot pray, but the fact is, is he's in heaven next to the Father. And what he does is he intercedes on our behalf. In Hebrews chapter 2, and in verses 17 and 18, Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 17 and 18, you read, In all things Jesus had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus understands what we're going through. That's the point that you are dealing with here. And over in chapter 7 and in verse 25 we read there, he also is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. One who intercedes is one who pleads your case. We read over in 1 John 2 and in verses 1 and 2 that he is our advocate when we sin. So he is the one who, who pleads our case before God. And in this song, we are just reminding ourselves that when we are facing trials, to remember that Jesus is there pleading for us. And it, it is our hope that we are in such a place where he will be pleading for us. I ask you this, are, are we thankful for everything that Jesus went through so that he does understand what we are enduring? So we go on in our song, it talks about how lest by base denial, I depart from me. So we're asking our Lord to plead on our behalf, lest we deny him. You know, it is clearly taught in scripture that we must confess him and that we cannot deny him and have any hope. 
In Matthew 10 and in verse 32, Jesus said, Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. May we never deny him is the challenge that we give consideration to in this text. In Hebrews chapter 10 and, and in verse number 38, you read in that particular text there that the Hebrew writer says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We have to live by faith and ensure that we are not drawing back. We're not giving up. We're not departing from him, which is the idea of drawing back in that text. And there's several warnings throughout the book of Hebrews that point toward that particular situation. We need to be reminded that we can deny him. For example, in Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse number 1, we read there, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. It's possible for us to wander away from him, to drift away from him, and be in a position where we are no longer in his presence. Therefore, in our song, we are reminded, When thou seest me waver, with a look recall. As I'm wavering, uh, when, when, when I reach the point where I am wavering as to the truth, and understand, I need to be looking to him. And this reminds me, you know, just, just like Peter, when he finally looked at the Lord and the Lord looked at him, it brought him back to his senses. He realized where he was. He realized what he had done. And he knew that he needed to do something about it. When we are wavering, when, when we are struggling with temptations and trials and tribulations in this life, we need to look to the Lord. We need to consider various things associated with him. And if and this song actually talks about some of those. So if I'm wavering, you know, reminded to look the way that Peter did and recall all that Jesus has done for us. Now, how can we how can we look to Jesus? How can we use that as a strength in our lives? Well, one thing is by continued study of his word. We read in Hebrews 4 and verse 12 that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than to any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is living and powerful. It can convict. It can cut to the heart. It can cause us to turn our lives around. So if we're continuing, continually studying his word, we're going to come across those passages that are going to remind us about where we are. And if we're doing what we shouldn't do, they remind us about how we need to get back on track. That is the look that can cause us to recall where we belong. I think about continually examining ourselves as to whether we are in the faith. We need to do that occasionally. I think about prayers, praying to God for strength, praying for God to, to help us overcome whatever temptations we are facing, praying to God to help us see those things that are contrary to his will. I think about sermons that cut to the heart, sermons that convict us. And friends, if you are being convicted and you're not where you need to be, are you going to do something about it? That's the look that can uh, that with which we can recall when we are wavering and he goes on nor for fear nor favor suffer me to fall so with a look recall so that we will not fall whether we are facing fears or favor how often is it that people fail when they face fear in other words they won't stand up and they don't stand up because of their fears. We're told in uh, Matthew chapter 16 and in verse number 26, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? 
Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's the warning that is given there. You know, are we going to fear man or are we going to fear God? You know, do not fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell or, or, or destroy the body but, but cannot touch the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And that is the warning you have in Matthew 10 and in verse number 26. So we have the warning there not to be fearful. And with that look, May it cause us when we are facing fears to stand up to them or, or favor. And what I think about there is benefits of the world. You know, somebody who's looking for advantage where this world is concerned. And, and, uh, and there are those who will deny the Lord when it's inconvenient for them to, to serve him. You know, uh, they'll serve him as long as they don't have anything else going on. But if there's, if there's some other thing that they want to be doing, it stands in their way of putting God first. And friends, we need to understand that we can fall. I think that's one of the things that this song reminds us of. Whether that's what the original author had in mind or not, it reminds us of the fact that we can fall. Galatians 5 and verse 4 talks about how you fall from grace. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 12 warns us, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and in verse number 11, we read there in that particular text, it says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Be, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, is the warning of Peter as he concludes his second letter. So we find over and over we are warned of the possibility of falling. And we need to be aware of that. And that's why we need to remember our Lord. And especially in the hour of trial. That's when we're most vulnerable. So let us turn to the Lord in those hours so that he can plead our case before our Heavenly Father. He can help. Over in 1 Corinthians 10.13. You read there, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. There's no temptation we face in this life that we cannot overcome if uh, we will put our trust in Him. 2 Peter 2, 9 talks about how He knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. May we appreciate that fact. Now that brings us to the second verse of this song, which, which, which uh, is when we are in the hour of trial, help me to remember Calvary. We read there, with forbidden pleasures, would this vain world charm, or its sordid treasures spread to work me harm. Bring to my remembrance sad Gethsemane, or in darker semblance, cross-crowned Calvary. So here we find that as we are facing trials, the point is made here with, with forbidden pleasures, would this vain world charm? And of course, the idea of that expression is the world is trying to tempt us. We live in a world that is filled with lust. The world that is filled with things that in God's word, they are forbidden. In the world, many of them are acceptable and many people get caught up in, in many of these ungodly behaviors, sexual immoralities, you know, fornications, gambling, uh, 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 drinking, social drinking, uh, uh, dancing. And you can just go on and on down the list of various types of, uh, of activities that, that lend to lustful and, and sinful behaviors and so on. And, and uh, they're sinful within themselves. That's why we avoid those behaviors. And the world is encouraging us to do those things, oftentimes to encourage you uh, to, to draw you into a place where you can drink. You find the bright signs that are flashing. You see the wonderful commercials that, that talk about how it doesn't get any better than this to, to, to take a beer and, and get drunk on, on a lake or, or, or something like that. That's the world charming you. We're told in 1 John 2 and verse 15 not to love the world or the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, 
The lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. In verse 17, he says that world's passing away. And the lust thereof. So you must keep doing the will of God. So we live in a world that's filled with, with lust and temptation. And this song reminds us of that in verse number 2. With forbidden pleasures would this fain world charm. Or with sordid, tr sordid treasures spread to work me harm. And what I see in that expression is materialism. The pursuit of things. And in many instances, this may be things that are not wrong within themselves, which is the distinction between these two phrases. The first one is about lusts. And it's about forbidden things, those things that are contrary to God's word, but popular and acceptable in the world. Now we find materialism, which, which like I said, having stuff is not wrong within itself, but it is dangerous. And if we live our lives for the pursuit of things, it's going to entrap us. In Matthew 13 and in verse 22, as Jesus described the the thorny ground in the parable of the sower. He talked about how the, the cares of this world and riches choke the word of God out. Or over there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. Where you find in that particular text there that Paul says, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some, having strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The desire to be rich is a temptation. It's a danger. And as we're singing this song, we remind ourselves that our life is not about pursuing lustful pleasures, and it's not about pursuing stuff. May that not be our priority in everything that we do in this life. Or sort of, may those things not harm us. And when those things are a temptation to us, bring to my remembrance sad Gethsemane. You know, I want you to think about what Jesus went through when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. You go back to Luke's account, which we looked at with Peter denying the Lord, and you find there in Luke 22 and in verse number 14, as our Lord is in the Garden there, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not verse 14, it's actually over in Luke chapter 22, and uh, we find in verse number, verse number 40, 1 through 43 and 44. And what you find in verse number 44, it says, Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus earnestly prayed to the Father because of, because of what he was going through. He was enduring a lot. And what I want you to understand about the garden is the intense sufferings that were taking place on that particular occasion. And the point is to remember what Jesus went through for us. You know, Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 talks about how he left heaven. His in humility, an example of humility. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking, up the, taking on the form of a man and coming in the likeness of man. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus, it was in the garden where he resolved once and for all, that he was going to carry out the plan that we needed. When he said, if, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That was the emphasis of that particular text. And in our song, you know, when, when we're tempted to let the lusts of this world give us a little bit of temporal pleasure, or, or, or the luxuries and the monies of this world to give us pleasure and, and, and to keep us from doing and being what we ought to be. Remember what Jesus gave up for us and how intense he suffered. And it was not because he was guilty of anything, but because we are. And this, this verse, I love the way that it says this. Bring to my remembrance, sad Gethsemane, or in <coughs> darker semblance, <coughs> cross-crowned 
Calvary. Friends, that's a reference to the crucifixion, where Jesus died for our sins. And I want you to understand that if you do any research whatsoever on the crucifixion, you will appreciate how cruel it actually was, how harsh of a, of a, of a form of punishment that was. When the Romans used crucifixion, their intent was at least twofold. Number one, it was to exact extreme punishment on somebody that had rebelled against the empire or done something horrific. But the other thing about a crucifixion is it was designed to send a message to others, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't conform. Friends, Crucifixion was a horrible, horrible death. And Jesus died that as a sacrifice because you and I are guilty of our sins. He died for us. And may we never forget that. And there's so many things in scriptures that remind us about his death crucifixion and what it means. And you know, do, do you not find it interesting that, that just prior to Jesus going to the Garden of Gethsemane, he's with his disciples and he institutes the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? It is a memorial of what he went through and why he went through that. That's why we partake of that every week as, as we're given instructions. You know, and another thing is, I'm reminded of a song that is in our current hymnal, Hymns for Worship, which is entitled, I'm the One. It's number 604 in our, in, in, in our songbook. And, and it's a song that reminds us that even though we were not physically there, because it happened 2,000 years ago, every time I sit on earth, I feel that I'm the one. I'm the one who shouted, crucify. I'm the one who made his cross so high. I'm the one who stood and watched him die. What have I done? I'm the one. What a powerful song that is. In, in, in reminding us of, of, of Gethsemane and, and, and of, uh, of Calvary. And friends, we need to remember that when we're tempted to follow the ways and the things of this world. That brings us to our third verse, where as we remember the cross, help me to cast all my cares on him. Help me to realize that God is there for me. We read in verse 3, it says, Should thy mercy send me sorrow, toil, and woe? Or should pain attend me on my path below? Grant that I may never fail thy hand to see. Grant that I may ever cast my care on thee. So in this verse, we find the encouragement to put our trust in him. It begins, should thy mercy send me sorrow, toil, and woe, or should, or should pain attend me on my path below. In all of this expression, what we find here is the fact that we're going to be suffering something that, again, this it's about the hour of trial. Now, what I find interesting about this is the way this is written here, should thy mercy send me. And, you know, that's an interesting way to describe trials and tribulations. I do not believe that God tempts us to sin. But I do believe that God sometimes will do or will allow something to be done to make us stronger, and sometimes to bring us back in line, to give us a chance to return to him when we are wandering away. That's why the Hebrew writer, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, and beginning in about verse number 5 there, he talks about how we are not to despise the chastening of the Lord. And he gives there the example of a father who loves his son, and he talks about how chastisement is not pleasant when it is meted out. You know, no one wants to be spanked or lose privileges or whatever the punishment is. And for a punishment to be appropriate, it has to be something that is unpleasant and something that will cause you to think about what you've done that you should not do. And understand that sometimes sorrows, toil, and woe in our life are 
a product of the mercy of God because he's given us a chance to return to him. He does not desire that any should perish. And that's the point that we give consideration to. And, and, and you read there that while, while trials are, are, are not pleasant when they're offered, you read there in verse uh, uh, 10 of Hebrews 12, For they indeed for a few days chastised as it seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastisement seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In other words, it can make you better. That's what Paul said over there in Romans 5. Romans 5 and in verse 3, in verse number 3, where he there said, not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. It makes you stronger. It can make you better. If you overcome your trials and temptations, you will be stronger. So you can be upset and angry because of what you are going through. Or you can go through whatever it is that is in your way and come out on the other side better. Come out on the other side stronger. You know, I'm reminded of how so many people in this world when it comes to suffering, and, and you know, the attitude that a lot of people have about God is, you know what, I, since I've surrendered to you, I expect you to uh, to deliver me from every type of problem. And and, and when, when Christians have to start going through some type of a horrible struggle, whatever it is, they might cry out, why me? You know, and I just simply remember hearing a number of years ago from somebody, you know, when you're suffering, how about this? Why not me? Why should I be the one that is exempt from the sufferings that are in this world as long as I am in the world? Now, I can let those sufferings tear me down and destroy me and make me bitter and make me worse, or I can work through them and come out on the other side better and come out on the other side stronger and more faithful. My path below reminds me that this world is temporary. We have something better to look forward to when this life is over. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and beginning in verse number 16. 2 Corinthians 4 and beginning in verse 16. Paul there said, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And he even goes on in chapter 5. We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands. And we earnestly desire to be further clothed in that. Friends, let us remember that on this earth, we're pilgrims. That we are foreigners and strangers. And that we are citizens in the kingdom of God. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. I think there's another song that talks about that. So we're facing troubles in this life. And friends, it's going to happen as we live this life. But as this song reminds us, when I'm going through that, grant that I may never fail thy hand to see. Now we know that this world lies under the sway of Satan. He's the ruler of this world. And he has so many that are under his dominion. And it sometimes seems overwhelming. And as we look at the news media and as we look at society around us and as we see the continued increase in immorality and, and, and just wickedness and just selfish pursuits that so many are engaged in, we see Satan is full well in control of what is going on around here. But I want you to understand that he's not in complete control. God has the ultimate control. He always has, 
and he always will. Friends, when Jesus came to this earth the first time to establish his kingdom, he established his kingdom. He didn't fail to do what he intended to do the first time, as, as some would have you to believe in one way or another. He accomplished exactly what he intended then, and he's accomplishing exactly what he intends to accomplish now. And when this world comes to its conclusion, he will accomplish what he intends to accomplish. In 1 John 4 and verse 4, you read that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In 1 John 5 and in verse 4, we read there that our victory is the faith. Faith is our victory that helps us to overcome the world. Will we trust God? Grant that I may never fail thy hand to see. Grant that, grant that I may never fail to keep trusting in God. And I want you to realize, and don't forget that he, he knows exactly what you're going through. Our Lord understands because he came down to this earth so that he could understand and so that we could not say that he couldn't understand. He knows what we are going through. And he's taking notes and, 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 and he understands and he sees how you deal with what happens. So help us to never forget that no matter what happens in this life, we are ultimately at his fate, and he is in control. And in the end, depending on the way we respond, will depend on what happens to us. And the song concludes here, Grant that I may ever cast my care on thee. And this is taken from 1 Peter 5, verses 7, or verses 6 and 7, where we are told there, cast all your cares on him, because he cares for you. The next verse warns about Satan seeking to devour in verse 8. But the warning is here, that he cares about us. Help us to never forget that. Help us to never forget that we need him. You know, I'm reminded of how Jesus told his apostles in John 15 and verse 5, where he said, I am the, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he said, without me, you can do nothing. Unless we are dwelling in him, we cannot do nothing. And friends, as you're going through this life and you're dealing with whatever you are dealing with, don't forget to pray to God. That's how we come to him. We boldly come to his throne pleading for his grace and pleading for his strength and help as we deal with whatever we are dealing with. We are to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Or over in James 5 and verse 16, if any, or 13, if anyone is suffering, let him pray. Verse number 16 is where he talks about the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Friends, help us to never forget to leave it in God's hands no matter what we're going through. And ultimately to let him take care of it. That's not easy to do. But it's something that the faithful Christian, when you learn to do that, it will give you a peace that this world just cannot and will not understand. A peace that passes understanding. And there we have this song. The three verses. Now there is a fourth verse that talks about eternity. And it, and it says this, and actually in, in, in sacred selections, this verse is in there. When my last hour cometh, fraught with strife and pain, when our dust returneth to the dust again, on thy truth relying, through that mortal strife, Jesus, take me dying to eternal life. And basically the whole point of this verse is to endure, to keep enduring to the end, and understand that if you endure to the end, when you finally pass from this life, you have hope of a better one when this life is over. And heaven surely will be worth it all. So there we have this song. And as we will do when we assemble together, we will sing this song following the lesson. And I encourage you, if you have access to a copy of this song, that you take a moment and sing it. Sing it in your mind so that you can get it, the, uh, the message of the song ingrained, ingrained in your mind, so that next time you sing it, it will mean that much more to you. And with that, I just encourage you to, to, to think about these, time, these times. 
We're all going to face hours of trial in our life. The question is, is when you face that hour, who are you going to turn to? Will you turn to the Lord for help? Think about that. And the lesson is yours. And if you will, at this time, please bow with me. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, once again we come to you. Once again we thank you for the abundance of blessings that you have showered upon us. We are especially thankful at this time that you so loved us that you sent Jesus to this earth to die. And we are thankful that he was willing to leave heaven, to come to this earth, to sacrifice so much, to give us an example. That when we give up and when we are called upon to give up things in this world, whether it be the pl passing pleasures of sin, or whether it be uh, the material comforts that stand in our way of serving you. Dear God, help us to be willing. Help us to be willing to do whatever is necessary. So that when we stand in that hour of trial, we will overcome and we will be more and greater prepared to stand before you and to be with you for all of eternity. Guide us through this day, through this week, Help us in all that we do to keep trusting you the way that we should. We ask this in your son's name and amen. And again, thank you for listening. Hopefully you have found some benefit in the encouragement of this song. And I'll I, I tell you right now that God in his wisdom gave us songs as a way not only to praise him, but also to build each other up. And songs can help us to move through this uh, sinful and this crooked and perverse generation that we are in. So go through the day with a song in your heart and with hope as you strive to serve him. Thank you and have a good day and a good week.